My name is Jennifer Morose. I am the executive producer of The Current on leave this year to do uh, the Massey Fellowship with one of our panelists here, uh, Mustafa Dumbuya, who is a Sierra Leonean uh, journalist. And we also have Stephanie Jenzer, who is a field producer with The National, who was also covering the crisis um, in Monrovia, in Liberia. So we've got two of the hardest hit countries by the Ebola outbreak, which uh, continues, um, obviously in a, a lesser state than it was this time last year. Um, but what we'll do is we're going to have a brief introduction by both Stephanie and Mustafa uh, in terms of their history, the journalistic work that they've done. And then we're going to launch into a bit of a discussion, which I will moderate. And at the very, very end, uh, there will be an opportunity, about 15 minutes, for questions. So uh, as you're listening, please keep your questions at the ready. And uh, there will definitely be an opportunity just when that time comes around, just put up your hand and um, I will point you out and we will get your question um, asked and answered. Uh, so I'll start, uh, why don't we start here with you, Stephanie. Um, hi, uh, I am not Adrienne Arsenault. <laughs> um, uh, let's see, I mean, some of you I know and you know me, I've uh, uh, been at CBC probably over 20 years now, um, been working in this business probably 30 years. Um, I look, I've been very fortunate in, uh, although I started at CBC sort of on the desk working writer, lineup editor, I, I spent most of my time in the field starting locally and, and, um, eventually being lucky enough to travel to some of the most interesting places in the world. I think, um, I, and I worked, I actually was the producer for our Middle East bureaus for about three and a half years as, as well. Um, so in terms of, you know, war zones, disasters, big events, I've been very fortunate. I've seen most of them on just about every continent except Antarctica. Um, Adrian and I have known each other for a very long time, almost 20 years as well. We've done a lot of assignments together and, and uh, together with J.F. Bisson, um, who is, as far as I'm concerned, one of the best camera editors in the business. Uh, we were uh, last summer, oh, well, not last summer, the summer before, the, when the discussions opened about sending a team to Liberia, the three of us kind of huddled together and um, uh, we all for decided almost without any doubt that we were in and we wanted to do this. Um, and so it all began uh, from there. Mustafa? Thank you very much, Jen. Hello, my name is Mustafa Dumbuya and it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. I am from Sierra Leone in West Africa and I work as a human rights journalist mainly with the BBC Media Action and the BBC Media Action is the international development media charity of the BBC World Service in the UK. My journalism career actually started way back in school. I started developing interest in this business or trade way back in school and that passion keeps me going and until in university where I had the opportunity to work with to volunteer with the university teaching radio and from there I did my passion developed more I started there as just a disc jockey you know playing music and getting my colleagues in school entertain and having fun. It was well, it's, you know, which is very important role the media plays. But as I went up the ladder, I realized maybe I needed to go a bit further and get a little bit serious because at some point you play music and every day you have your friends sending in you messages and saying, oh, you're the best DJ in town. You play the best song. And at some point I said, okay, well, if I play the best songs, maybe it's high time I thought about doing something else and moving my career ahead. And that's when I really started doing serious journalism. 
I started off with a program we, in radio we call it, it's a community concern. And uh, it's, the program is called Community Concern. It's basically just bringing out issues affecting communities around Sierra Leone and getting people to speak about issues affecting them and also trying to get duty bearers accountable for some of these things. What if, you know, by the time I graduated, I was lucky to get a job with the BBC Media Action. And after I've got a lot of, well, skills working as a journalist at the university, moving around Sierra Leone, I got a job as a community media trainer with the BBC Media Action. And what that did for me is to place me in a particular community radio station for six months. And while there, I try to provide training for the community journalists. I offer encouragement and also just show how they can use the media to improve accountability of local authorities. And that's worked very well for me. And very proud of some of the achievements we got with some of the community radios we, I worked with. You know, my interest actually in journalism is more, you know, in radio, I also work with online publications and sometimes TV, but my interest mainly is on radio. It's also because of where I find myself. I find myself in a society which is highly illiterate. We have like a 65% illiteracy rate. And so many people cannot read or write or Television is also not accessible for people because then electricity, they don't have electricity and they cannot even afford to buy a television set. So the only way they can access the news and which is very easy for them is radio. And so that's why I chose to work on radio and it's very important. And that's how many people in my country get to know what's happening around them and in the communities. I will talk more later, but there's a little bit introduction about my you know, career and one of the most important work I have done so far is covering the recent Ebola outbreak in my country, which is something I will talk more on later. Thanks, Mustafa. Um, I think we're going to, we'll start with you, Mustafa, because um, this outbreak is, as just a little reminder, tracing it back, it was a two-year-old boy in Guinea. Um, in December 2013, who died, and that was that was patient zero for this. In March, the outbreak actually was recorded in Guinea, later confirmed as Ebola. In May, the first case was recorded in Sierra Leone. Mustafa, can you take us back to those early days when the first cases were being reported in Sierra Leone? What were what were your friends thinking? What were people in Sierra Leone thinking? Um, as this news started to come out? Those were really very difficult moments for every civil union because we, we are faced with a situation. I mean, and I said we, it's not just, you know, it's every civil union. We are faced with a situation where we have a very alien or mysterious disease that we've never heard of. We've never had, a lot of people never heard of the word Ebola until it's, you know, until it's struck civil union. So, and that's the same even with me. I only got to know about Ebola when we started having cases in Guinea. And that's when I got to Google and look up Ebola and read its history and knew how disastrous it could be. And it's the same for many civil unions. So the, rest, the early response to this it was people did not believe it. People thought it's not, they don't call it Ebola. So they try to find ways to name it. Some say it's as, it is as a result of witchcraft. So for them, as far as they're concerned, this thing they, we now call Ebola did not exist for them. They don't know about it. It's witchcraft. It's people who have been caused. It's, you know, people who, you know, there are also um, our conspiracy theories around it initially. People also said, well, okay, well, it's the government, you know, trying to reduce certain you know, population in certain regions in order, you know, where they know in terms of election, they will not get enough votes so that when elections come, there, will, there won't be any more people in that particular region because the country is highly polarized. 
civil ministerially polarized in northwest and southeast. And the government, the current government actually has its stronghold in the south, in the northwest. So the Ebola came in through the southeast. And this was a time also, you know, the country was preparing to go into a national census before Ebola struck. So people thought, okay, because we wanted to go to census, the government had now come up with something to kill people. And so they could come up with any figures at the end and say, well, this is the figures for the Southeast. So people did not believe it. And there are some also unscrupulous politicians then who we are fanning this, mes you know, this message. And if you have a population that is highly illiterate and people cannot really know better, and it, they cannot go to Google like I did to read about Ebola. They couldn't access information. All that means the journalists, our journalists themselves, don't know much about this. The medical doctors they don't know much about Ebola, and it's called that manifested itself on how many health workers we actually lost during the crisis. So it's like strange to everyone, and everyone is lost. So if if everyone was lost, including some of the journalists, what what were the what were the journalists initially reporting? And what sort of reporting were you doing in, in those early days? So when we started reporting on Ebola, even before it actually came to Sierra Leone, we started reporting on it since when it was in Guinea. OK, but then but this was a time, and because it was also in Guinea, people thought, well, it's a Guinean thing. It's not about us. It's about Guinea. It's not about us. And, even at that, they did not take it seriously until it finally arrived in Sierra Leone. And so the government started all the messages that we are coming out, we are more like customized messages. And these were messages that have been designed by the government. So the initial messages coming out of the media were like, Ebola is a deadly virus and it kills. And this is one thing that we actually went wrong as a nation. The initial, we missed the battle at the initial, you know, at the, at the inception of it by telling people that Ebola is a virus that kills and it cannot be cured. So when later you want to change that message to tell people that if you go to the hospital, you can get help, people said, no, you've already told us this virus kills and it cannot be cured. So why do I need to go to the hospital? I would rather have my family, I would rather have my child die with me at home rather than taking him or her to the hospital. So communication gap, miscommunication at the inception stage was also a very, very serious challenge that is still haunting the, you know, these three nations. And I it's not just Sierra Leone, it's the same with Guinea, it's the same with Liberia. People didn't get it right initially. And the media as well is guilty of this. You know, because as I st stated earlier, journalists, didn't know about Ebola. And so they rely on the government's the Ministry of Health on weekly um, press conferences to tell them what to say. You know, we don't have experts, health reporters who can come up with to tell you that this is what happened. So journalists, once they get these messages from the government, they also go and say Ebola kills, you know, and they just report it as it is. And that's a very serious challenge, you know. I was fortunate earlier also to get the United States Embassy in Sierra Leone got, you know, an expert, someone who has been from the CDC, who had a workshop with us and trained us about Ebola and told us about Ebola as well. I got more knowledge about the virus. So I was more prepared actually to now start working and developing messages and reporting from the field. We'll come back to some of those messages, but I just want to switch gears and, and come over to you now, Stephanie. You and Adrian um, traveled to Monrovia in end of September 2014. Um, can you, you've, as you've said, you've been around the world, you've, you've covered a lot of different conflicts. Um, when you were preparing to go to Liberia, I mean, what was going through your head? Were you, were you, were you scared, apprehensive? Um. I mean, it's it was it was a it was a long process actually. You know, getting prepared, <laughs> um, and it wasn't it wasn't just all us. Uh, I mean, it's it's a very different perspective because, of course, 
foreign, uh, well, journalists around the world, in, including you. I mean, we'd never dealt with anything like this on this scale before. And so we were, we spent most of the summer, uh, I think, just watching developments and, and sort of getting to the point when we realized, um, you know, as a, as, as a news organization, as a public broadcaster, we had to jump in and do something to, to go. But the whole process was, was actually quite long. Um, we were talking about this earlier. I mean, initially, in sort of mid-summer, uh, August, early September, we were considering going to Sierra Leone. And, and that thinking, you know, shifted as our preparation continued. And the preparation was actually quite intense in terms of um, because nobody had ever gone into such a, an environment before. There was so much unknown. How do you pro properly prepare yourself? Um, how many people should go? That was actually quite an interesting discussion. How, how big a team should the CBC team be that actually goes in? And of course, from a, a news perspective and, and all the platforms we serve, as you know, um, there was an argument for more people. Whereas Adrian and I and JF argued, no, we have to keep the team quite small because, um, you know, the, the smaller group of people, the more control you can have in your environment. And of course, you don't want to, when there are risks involved, <laughs> you know, um, have a large group that, that needs. And, and, and the, the very reality as, as foreign journalists going into places like this, it's not just the three of you. It's, it's a local fixer, it's drivers, it's, um, in our case, CBC decided um, to also send us with a, uh, you know, so-called security consultant who happened to be um, a medic, uh, not because, you know, we were going to do something stupid. I mean, I mean, it was just for the reason that uh, prudence, but all these things took time. Before we left, we met with infectious disease experts here. We learned how to use the personal protection equipment properly. We, we, we took that gear off and on and off and on so many times just to learn how to do it right, learn how to do it, you know, um, I was going to say quickly, but it's not a quick process. It's a, it's a careful process. Um, we, we had to make sure that, that, you know, everything was done right. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, this, is, this was an assignment like no other that I've ever had. And I've had a lot of very interesting assignments just because nobody had done it before. We were looking around. I was looking for other journalists to speak to who had gone into Sierra Leone and Liberia. And, you know, local ones perhaps, yes, but also... Um, foreign journalists. And in Canada, there had only been one at that point. Uh, a Toronto Star newspaper reporter, health or Jennifer. Yeah. Uh, who you probably... I missed, I <laughs> yeah. missed Jennifer. And I had long discussions with her, you know, and I was part of the due diligence. And, and um, you know, we, to this day, we sometimes exchange messages. Um, but I don't think, I mean, when I said earlier that, that Adrian, JF, and I decided that there was no question this is something that we wanted to do, was important to do. Um, were we scared? Were we nervous? I mean, I guess a little, but I think probably some of the people around us were more concerned. I mean, we knew, given everything we had, we had done in our lives, our careers, that if you prepare properly, that you can, and you and you are able to, to the best of your ability, control your environment and, and, and the situation, we were going to be okay. We knew that. Right. So the fear or concern, it, it, sure, there was some of it, but because but, anything can happen, obviously, anywhere. You cross the street and something can happen. But, but um, I think it was actually, I think some of our friends, family, um, co-workers were probably more scared for us. We had a job to do, and we knew we were preparing really, really well. Uh, we'd gone through tough assignments before. Um, 
it, it, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but just you may want to talk about it later. But the interesting part was, unlike other assignments where, you know, there's a before, there's a during, and then it's sort of, you move on. <laughs> There was a definite after period too, and um, yeah. <laughs> um, but but this again speaks to the concern of some of our the people closest to us, our coworkers, our family, our friends, that kind of thing. But you know, I think I had my most anxious moment in the airplane on the way over there, and where I thought, okay, this is real. <laughs> We're really doing this. Um, nobody's, you know, not a lot of foreign journalists have done this. Um, but it was quite fleeting. And once we were there and actually on the ground, and one of the first thing we saw, you know, we walked off the airplane and there was a, 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 a container with a spout on it with a bleach solution. The moment we stepped out of the airplane, we were disinfecting. And we're like, okay. And we had all our, our own disinfecting gear with us. We're like, okay, we can, this is, this is manageable. The risk is manageable and, and we can, we have a job to do. And we've, in fact, we were already doing it. We shot some stuff on the airplane on the way there too. So um, one of the things we're, we're talking about precautions and I'd like to just, you talked about this, the suit that you tried on yeah, yeah. multiple times before you went. Um, just briefly for both of you, um, what precautions were you taking on the ground as you were reporting this? Well, it's, it's funny. I was, I was, I was going to say, you should ask me how many times we actually used it on the ground, and the answer was zero. Really? Really. So why? Um, because, look, we, we, took, we took tremendous precautions. We had several sets of rubber boots that we used. We always wore, you know, obviously, long pants, long sleeves. We had gloves on. Uh, carried disinfect around. We had created these bottles with uh, spray bottles with with disinfectant solution. You know, we would be whenever we'd enter and exit places that was used. You know, we had these these um, chlorine wipes that we took with us. In fact, there was a, a moment before we even got on the plane when we realized they were the wrong ones. They weren't strong enough. You know, so we adjusted. But the suits themselves. We, we, we didn't need, because you know, we never put ourselves in that risk where we, you know, I mean, the only way you could get Ebola was direct, direct contact, and, and we never made direct contact with an infected person. There was always a distance. There was no need to put on that suit. Um, and, you know, I mean, the, our, the precautions we were taking, I mean, we, we carried around our gear and our notebooks and our uh, everything. We, we carried around knapsacks on our backs. We would, we would not even put down that knapsack anywhere. They stayed, I have, there were shots of Adrian, so many of them in stand-ups, and she's carrying that big backpack because it will not go on the ground. It won't go onto a table that could be um, contaminated in some way. That's how religious we were. So we knew we were never at risk. And so we didn't have to put on that suit. And even when we went to some of the hospitals and, and the MSF facilities, um, you know, they, they concurred with what we were doing and our practices. They, they're quite, you know, fastidious about that stuff too. So if you are in direct contact with an Ebola patient, somebody who has, then you then you put it on. The body collectors had them, the, 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 the workers, the, the health workers, the, you know, it, it wasn't necessary. And, you know, when we left, we, we came with the supply. We left them there for the people to use, the ones who needed them. Mustafa? I mean, as she said, it's, Ebola can only be transferred if you come into direct contact with a sick person. And that's what's one thing a lot of people don't understand about. And so they think like when someone sneezes or when someone walks this way, you can get Ebola. You can only get it when you actually get into contact with someone who is really, really sick. But I also always ensure that, you know, I fully take precautionary measures before ever I go into the field to do any reporting. You know, because sometimes I see, you know, those you know, there is no story that's actually worth your life. You know, but it's also very, for me, reporting from the field. In as much as I, I was very sure 
of the measures I was taking to stay safe, but that sometimes naturally you also just get scared, you also get worried. Yeah, because you are burying your comp you know, in a country of just about six million people, and there was a time we are burying about 130, 140 people every day. And it gets you scared because you might be everyone is a potential, you know, everyone is a potential victim of Ebola. So you get worried about even going to the field to report. There was a time I went to do a report, and that's the closest I've come to Ebola, and that, that really got me scared. That was in December 23rd, 2014. I went to the government hospital because there had just been a national um, campaign in the city by the government. They call, you know, house to house search, operation house to house search. And so the government encouraged everyone in the city to bring out sick people in their homes to the government hospital so they can diagnose them for free and find out whether it's Ebola or it's any other. We now call Malaria, we call it a normal disease, which is not normal anyway, but we say malaria is normal, you know, because people prefer to get malaria than to get Ebola. Because they know with malaria, they can't, you know, get drugs. But after this campaign, we had a lot of people that were brought to the government hospital. And most of them have, were diagnosed and they did not get Ebola. But the challenge now is these people are abandoned by their own families and they don't want them back. In. They don't want them back in their homes. And the government also didn't do well. They didn't take them back with ambulances and no public transport or taxi can take sick people because it's been you know, said over and over on radio and everywhere that you shouldn't take any sick person in your public transport. So these people were just like sitting around, you know, loitering around the, the hospital. So I went there to do a story. And when I got back home that day, on the 23rd, you know, I was so worried. I was thinking, and I, I got regular flashbacks of what I saw in the hospital and people lying down hopelessly and, you know, young, you know, children and women and a lot of these things. So I got back home with those, with those worries. I, you know, the next morning, I had fever. I was sick and I was worried and I thought, oh, well, I went to the hospital yesterday. And this morning, I've already got a fever. And it's the 24th, the eve of Christmas. You know, the lucky thing is I was alone in my apartment. So I called my brother. I said, well, don't say this to anyone. Don't tell my mom. Don't tell anyone. But I'm not feeling too well today. And I will just observe my health for the next few hours. And if I don't feel it, I have drugs at home. If I don't feel better, I will call the government's emergency line. So they picked me up because I actually went to the hospital and I'm sure about the, the precaution measures I, you know, I took. But I started thinking and it's called, it just wasn't my situation because I started thinking where I went wrong. And I thought honestly that I'd got Ebola because I was so worried. But then I took some drugs and I got better. So even though you take all these measures, if, because you see it every day, because, because the next, you know, the next morning your neighbor or someone you knew, is sick tonight, and in the morning, the next thing you hear is, he is dead, she is dead. And it happens all over you. At some point, you feel like there is no hope. And I actually lost hope at some point. I thought, you know, this might be the end for all of us, because you, we, people are dying every day. Every day you're hearing about. You're not getting any good news. You're not getting any news about a new vaccine that has been discovered. You're not hearing about any response from the interna international community then that is helpful. All you hear was about people are dying and you are on the field and you report on it and you see it every day. So you take all these measures, but honestly, the fear is still there. Um, yeah, I mean, you were, you were not only reporting this, you were, you were living it. Yeah. Um, and, and we were having a discussion the other night and uh, Mustafa had said he, he's lost quite a bit of family to Ebola while he was reporting and, and you, you said that you didn't even know how many people yeah. you'd lost until after the fact. After the fact. So, in each, you know, my extended family, and that's my mom's family, they lo initially we thought it's 16 people. And this is, my mom came from a place, um, it's called Putloko in the north. And this is one of the most heat districts in Sierra Leone. You know, people were dying 
from this place. And, you know, my mom does not live there. And she got a call. And every day she got like a call that, oh, we've lost five today again. Oh, today, another, you know, another five in our family. And it's an extended family. So every day they keep losing people. And then she, you know, she calls me on the phone and said, you know, my family has been wiped out. Everyone is dying. And some of these people are people I know personally. They're my uncles, my aunts, cousins, you know. And it was a very challenging moment. We didn't know the actual figure of how many people we actually lost until recently when things are starting getting to normalcy, you know, no normalcy. And we realized that in the town and in the villages of mom and extended family, they lost over 50 people, you know. And what led to that massive loss was as a result of denial. And I spoke about denial initially when I started talking, that people were denying. And when it started in Port Loco, people said, this is not Ebola, this is witchcraft. This were, I mean, you know, this, this, this were, these were witches who were flying at night with a, a witch aircraft. I don't know how to explain a witch aircraft in English, but this is what they believe. And this, and this, air, this airplane, this witch airplane crash. And that is what's responsible. All those that were on that airplane going for this witch conference or meeting, these were the people that were dying. So no amount of persuasion or trying to convince them about seeking help, going to the hospital, will convince these people. And what worried me then the most as a journalist and as someone who had worked in that region was when I called some colleagues in Putloko from Freetown I said, what's happening? People are dying in Port Loco. And I mean, I'm personally affected. My family has almost been wiped out there. And some of them said, well, you know, this is really embarrassing. We don't want to say this to you, but these are people that are witches. So there is also stigma on these people. So these people are witch. And I spoke with people who I consider to be opinion leaders in these communities. And, you know, and these are journalists, these are, te these are teachers. And these are people who a lot of people rely on to get reliable information. And they were telling me the same. So if, you know, what's worried me is if this opinion, you know, so-called opinion leaders also believe that this is witchcraft and it's not Ebola, that this is something worrying. And as a journalist, I set out my own plans to respond to that challenge. With information, real information. With, with real information to counter those beliefs. And what I did then was to get, and I do most of this work with the BBC Media Action, what I did then was to get someone from the community, you know, an indigenous from this community that people in the community respect, that they, they trust him, to say to them that this is real and you should believe this. So I got, a police officer who is a very senior police officer, and this is someone that earns a lot of trust from these people. I got him to do a public service announcement, a short one, to say, I am this person. My family is personally affected. And what I'm saying, if you, I mean, you've known me for a long time. I've never lied to you. What I'm about to tell you as well today is the, is the fact. What we are experiencing in this town is not any witchcraft. It's not any mysterious thing. This is Ebola. It's a new disease that has struck our country. And that is responsible. And so he made this very clear to them. So that was when the hospital started receiving people coming voluntarily to report themselves, coming with their families to report that they are sick. So for me, the fight against Ebola is not just a fight that I was fighting like an outsider or from somewhere else. For me, it's a, it's, it's, it's a personal fight. Because I know as far as Ebola continues to stay in Sierra Leone, it will continue to haunt me where, you know, wherever I am. And even when I'm in Canada right now, getting to Canada was a challenge for me, you know, because I am from Sierra Leone. So even though I'm, even though I'm away, and even when I try to travel, I still you know, get picked out, and I'm still in airports and people, you know, just because of my, my passport. The moment I show my passport, I say, oh, you're from Sierra Leone, and then I, you know, I'm single out, and so, for me, the fight against Ebola is not just, you know, any other fight. It's a very, it's very personal one. One of the things um, that 
yeah, Mustafa has mentioned in another conversation is, is some, of the, some, some of the things that he was fighting against are these rumors that were pass, being passed around, but instead of social media that we have, like Twitter or Facebook, where everything's very, very happening very publicly, um, there the, the main social media tool is WhatsApp, which is very, it's one to one to one to one. Um, that makes it that much harder to, to, to combat or, or send out a message to, to combat it because it's happening so one-on-one. Um, Mustafa's -on -one. um, talked a, a little bit about the, the reporting barriers he faced. Stephanie, what sort of barriers did you guys face on the ground um, in terms of getting stories, uh, getting the right information out, getting people to talk? Um, I have to say uh, that that wasn't the biggest challenge. <laughs> um, I mean, well, I mean, of course. Did people welcome the the uh, the, the foreign media? People, not everyone did, but some uh, some people did. I mean, it was it was. Um, I mean, I definitely hear what you're saying. I I I when we arrived. In Monrovia, um, the 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 Ebola crisis had reached a real peak critical moment. We were there during the the the, the real peak of the crisis, and but I think it, we had they had almost reached a turning point there where um, awareness was really trying sinking in. That the 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 rumors the the um, how Ebola is 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 spread and um, this was sort of starting to pass a little bit and you saw um, you know signs up and billboards Ebola is real you know and it, I think it was at least in that urban environment it was slowly sinking in and that where to get help. Um, the problem was there were other obstacles there um, that us as journalists, you just had to, to, to look down the street, open your eyes, travel, and you would see them because you would see victims. First day we were there, just driving from A to B, and there's a victim, just a woman lying on the street. You know, I mean, there, was, there, there were not enough ambulances in Monrovia. This is a country that that um, doesn't really have its own ambulance system. It relied on <sighs> donations from the war that that the that these these they just existed and there but there was no real system. You had hospitals that we would arrive at and um, they had no drinking water. I mean, literally, you would you would show up, and and there was a woman who was actually a volunteer driving an ambulance who was there, reaching into her pocket, getting out a few coins, sending somebody to the store to get drinking water because there was no wa drinking water in the hospital. Um, these you just as reporters, you know, we had to show up and and just had to open our eyes, and the stories were there, the people were there, the the struggle was right in front of our eyes. Um, but the, the, the biggest challenge was, was actually one that a lot of you can appreciate here, and it's, it's more a, a challenge of <laughs> trying to, as a small team, then logistically get everything done and, and um, um, for in a very short period of time to make sure all of the CBC platforms are <laughs> serviced, and and that was the challenge. That was, you know, um, and I'll be honest, that that was a far greater challenge. And logistically doing that, doing that while logistically still working the day ahead. I mean, there were many days where you know Adrian and I, um, we would we didn't eat. We had a hotel. We had a fairly decent hotel. There was a, a restaurant there that um, I suppose we could have gone to. Some people did. Um, we didn't even have time to do that. We 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 would go out in the morning and we'd shoot all day and and gather our stories, and then we would have a a, a cycle of of news network and radio and national and online and photo galleries and essays and this and that too, 
And while we're doing that, we're also trying to logistically set up the next day what we're doing. Um, and some of that was, was a, a challenge because um, especially at the, uh, the, 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 the World Health Organization that was trying to run hospitals, the uh, folks at MSF who were actually doing, in my opinion, a very good job in Monrovia, they had a job to do as well. They wanted to help the media to, to create awareness and, and tell the stories of what was happening there. But they had a job to do as well. So we had to be aware of that and conscious of that, that but they knew our needs. And so literally it, it became sort of a week of, of logistically just, you know, 20 hours a day trying to keep this going and and you know the at the, the very last thing we had planned and we did have actually a logical order to the stories that we wanted to tell um that was that was planned out even in a perfect world mapped out before and one of our last things we wanted to do is we wanted to interview the president of liberia right. and which we did, which we did but it it almost didn't happen. I mean, it was, it was again, it was, you know, imagine trying to interview the president of a country. And, and yes, her country was going through an enormous crisis, but um, she, she had duties. She had responsibilities. She had things she needed to do. And, and making these arrangements um, took a month. And right down to the very last day, it was like it was off again. And then it was me calling back and restating the reasons why this was important to do and um, in the end yes we did but but some of those challenges uh, were probably greater than what was right in front of our eyes right yeah, yeah. Um, we're we are running out of time there's a couple of questions that I um, I want to get to before we get to the audience questions Mustafa um, just quickly just coming back to the fact that you were living this and reporting it how did daily life change as a result of Ebola for you um, and also for, for the population? What? I mean, there are a lot of changes that are caused by Ebola in the daily lives of people, especially the social and cultural lives of people. And a key one is, you know, the key message during the Ebola outbreak is you know, encouraging people to avoid body, con body contact. And that is a very key message because that's the only way people can transmit, you know, that's the easiest way to transmit the disease actually, it's body contact. And people have been used to handshaking, you know. People have been used to doing handshaking with their loved ones, their friends, when they meet people, the first thing they want to do is to stretch out a hand to shake it. And but then with Ebola, you don't have, you don't, you are no longer allowed to do that. Sometimes if you meet someone who is really more even aware, they will just snub you, if you, you know. And at a point in time, we even have fines in some regions or districts. If you, they will fine you for even taking out your hand to shake someone else's hand. You don't hug anyone. You don't do any handshakes. All forms of public gatherings were banned by the government. So social lifestyle for almost a year of people were almost putting, you know, on hold. You can no longer go to the bar, you cannot go to a restaurant, you cannot go to the beach, which we love so much. And, you know, on, so on weekends, or every weekend you have to go to the beach. For, for me, on weekends I have to go to the beach and play soccer. And that is, you know, completely stopped for a whole year. So in many ways, Ebola affected, you know, the social lives of people. A key thing that it also affects is, you know, the burial patterns of people. You know, I mean, we, it's not just, our people, in our tradition, we very much cherish burying our people. And because we feel it's a way of giving, being last respect to the departed soul. Now, when Ebola, you know, strikes, the government also banned this because, and that is the, if we check the statistics, most people who actually got Ebola, you know, was through touching dead bodies. And that is also stopped. So what happens, because to tell you that people really, 
cherish this tradition and be very cling on very strongly to it. At some point, even when they have, you know, the government had buried the ability, people will go and exhume the body at night and we beg and pray on it because they said the government had buried their loved one as a pagan. And he's not a, you know, our grandpa or our dad is not a, you know, was not a pagan. So they exhumed the body and we buried it again. And that did not help the situation. It just, you know, worsened it. And the Ebola just got more spread out because of those practices. And this way means we are, People get Ebola a lot, you know, touching dead bodies, you know, shaking hands. When they go to public transport, you know, because many, many people cannot afford cars, public transport is very popular. Everyone will, you know, everyone is scared of anyone. Everyone is a suspect. So when you go to public transport, I will be sitting there to find, I don't want you to touch me, I don't speak to you, I don't, you know. And it's not used to be the way. People used to have a chat on public transport. They used to touch each other, they, you know. People easily shake hands, they easily hug each other, and, but then that is also put on stop. So it's like Ebola was just against all the traditions that people have been used to. And that makes it more serious. It's not just that it is killing people, but it's also because it's like people call it the enemy. It's against everything that you've loved, everything that you've been used to, everything that you've practiced for a very long time. Ebola came to just put a stop on your life. So that makes it more really, really serious because it puts a stop on lots of people's social and cultural lives. And it also, that it also has a lot of psychological effects on people. I mean, I'll use my mom as an example on this. Because she couldn't attend burial ceremonies of her departed relatives, it affects her so much. The culture is when you lose someone, if the whole family comes together, and then, you know, you talk about it, and then you get consolation, gradually, you will forget about it. But here's a situation where you are not even allowed to go anywhere closer to the dead body. And you are not allowed to gather to pay any last respect. The government have their own official burial teams, they call them burial teams, that will come and take the body and just bury it. And there is a problem of many people don't even know where their families have been buried. It's only later that the start, government started putting on measures in order to now get the family in a level way participating in the burial activity, you know, procedures. Initially, when Ebola started, the family had no idea where their people are taken. They, when they die, they don't know where they are buried. And a lot of people have now psychological, you know, mental issues with regards to this. So this is why, I mean, when we talk about even post Ebola, and I'm sure it's something we will talk about here, these are the kind of issues that I think the media needs to focus on now. About these are the story is not over, and I, I and I might just say we we've just started, but unfortunately a lot of the international media has moved out, has backed out. It's now the responsibility of the, the local media, the community media, to take this on, you know. But I also. I also hope the international media, I also hope as you went to do cover the stories of, you know, people dying and the challenges, you can also go. When now Labiva has been declared Ebola free, you know, you can also go and report on the post Ebola, what's happening there. And there is a lot of things happening here that yeah. requires public attention. No, no, we we totally agree. I mean, Adrian and I have talked very publicly about wanting to go back. And follow up, and and I mean the, the there are so many stories to be told, and we talked a little bit about this, the 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 psychological effects, but the 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 survivors and the stigma around survivors is is really very serious. Um, now we're seeing that yeah. that it, that the virus can live on exactly, and the, even though it's probably not communicable. Yeah, so you have the physical. Um, after effects of Ebola and and the, the, the just the stigma of living it, um, we've been in. We've tried to keep in touch with a couple of people who we got to know when we were there and and to see how they're doing. Um, one of the the women we featured in one of our stories the day we arrived at the MSF clinic. She was being released. She had survived. She'd gotten her official certificate, and you know, for the first time in in 
months, you know, somebody touched her hand. She, she had no, no contact for so long until she was declared Ebola free. And um, uh, her story actually traveled around the world because it came up in the United Nations, um, how, how these small moments um, really speak to, to what's happening in West Africa. But she, she went home and she had lost some of her relatives, I think it was brothers, to Ebola, but she survived. She went home and she tried to run a little store she has in 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 the bottom of her house, where she, she basically sells water to people, drinks and and um, uh, little snacks. And nobody would come to buy from her anymore. You know, she was she had a certificate. I do not have Ebola anymore. It was, you know, she had survived it. She was not contagious, but nobody. Would come, and she had uh, she has kids and um, a family that uh, some families still around her, but some of them wouldn't even go near her. Um, she's what just one example in in a whole part of the continent that is that is affected by this stigma, and it's very real and it continues. Um, I'm I, I'm going to be quiet now, <laughs> and I'm going to turn um, this over to the audience. If anybody out there has any questions, um, please feel free. Jeff, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just curious. I mean, both of your, your your experiences were dramatically different. You being someone who lives in the area, you being someone who's gone in to, to visit. Um, but I think that uh, you know both the journalistic project for both of you involved uh, a, a significant amount of having to think ahead what my next move going to be in a, an environment that was pretty uncertain. I mean, as I recall, the onset of this was seemed to be exponential. Nobody really knew what was going to happen with it. So I guess my question is, is kind of twofold. One, um, what? How did you approach your risk management if things got to a point at which you would have to sort of pull the trigger and extricate yourself, kind of know what your option would, would be, Stephanie, is to get out, but I'm, I'm curious as to what your option may have been. S secondly, um, uh, you know, hopefully you don't find yourself in a situation like this again, but I think as, as journalists you could find yourself in an unpredictable, volatile situation like that. I would I wonder what your key learnings were from this from, from each of you. So it's basically, I use a very long recorder to do my interviews, for example. So it's like standing very far from you, using my microphone, asking you questions as you, you know, ensuring that, my, because it's also possible some people speak and they, you know, speak when they speak. So I'm also very conscious about my, the microphone, not getting it very, you know, it's also very careful not getting the microphone very close to people you are talking to because they might spit on it, which can, well, if this person happens to have a bull and it spits on a microphone that you have to touch at the end, it's a, risk. it's a risk. So you also have to take those kind of measures. So what I will always do is to have this Clorox. This we, 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 I have Clorox that I can always use to wipe. Whenever I've done an interview, I will ensure before I go, I try to clean my, you know, my mic very well and ensure that I clean the recorder as well, and whatever I think would be at risk, I ensure it's, it's properly sanitized. We did the exact same thing. Yeah, I ensure it's properly sanitized before, you know, I take them into my, you know, my bag or whatever we put them in. But it's ensuring that before you leave the scene, you are properly sanitized, ensuring that there is reasonable space between you and the interviewee, because in any way you have to speak to people because you need their stories. Otherwise, you'll not be able to tell the stories. But then, while doing that, you also have to be very careful about your own safety. And in some way, that is not the best. That was not the best thing, to, you know, to do. But that was available by then. But thankfully, I'm still alive. <laughs> one, of, one of my jobs was I, I had to take a lot of photographs, and um, uh, I, I didn't bring my very expensive camera. <laughs> quite deliberately because I didn't want to but I I shot a lot on um, uh, you know an iPhone and and um, one of those you know what do you call them little smaller compact cameras 
Um, but, you know, you, one of the things that, that we like to do when we, we um, travel to these places, we like to get very close to the faces. We remember the faces of these people that we learn their stories. And, you know, there's only so far you can zoom and, and, and um, you know, you have to be very careful. It's actually uncomfortable keeping a distance and trying to be intimate at the same time. So um, we took a lot of the same precautions, um, obviously, and I spoke about some of them, but, but I forgot to mention our, our daily temperature taking <laughs> that, we, that, we, that we did, you know, two, three times a day without fail. And in terms of an extraction plan, um, I mean, part of that was, was actually considering how long we would actually stay in the country. You know, the, the, the longer you stay, uh, like say you happen to be accidentally exposed, uh, you know, on day two, but your assignment was two weeks long or three weeks long, uh, you're getting out if you're actually showing symptoms could actually be a challenge, you know? Um, uh, because again, you know, I talked about the airports, you're checked, your temperature before you get on an airplane to leave, temperature is, is checked, you have questions to answer. And um, uh, so, so we did actually decided on a week, may have been eight days in the end, but you know, in that amount of time, we could do the stories we wanted to do, but also probably safely get out to be treated if we happened to be exposed on one of those those days. Um, but we were always monitoring, and and like I said, I was because we never came into direct contact with or or put ourselves at risk. We thought we were fairly confident in in our. Um, in our in our knowledge that that we hadn't been exposed, that we weren't going to get Ebola, um, so I, there was a journalist. It, 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 this was well known. It was right around the same period that that we we were there who who did who did uh, come down with Ebola, and he was working with an American crew, and and the American network did help him get out. I, I like to think that's what would have happened to us. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and when you came back, you, I mean, you, you didn't um, yeah. contract the disease, but uh, can you just speak a little uh, briefly about yeah. the reaction of others to you yeah, it returning? Was, it was this is at the height of the panic yeah. of yeah, we were, we were North there. Americans we were, were starting to... We were in Liberia when the first, first case in North America um, you know, came to light, and, and it was, it was a, a guy in, in Dallas who had traveled... He lived in Monrovia, where we were, and had just traveled over there, and and so the panic in 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 the United States, in particular, I think, was quite acute around the time we were there. And there was a decision made by you know CBC that we would we would um, not come into the office to work when we came back. And um, I mean, it wasn't I I. I refuse to this day to call it a quarantine, although some people will call it that. I mean, we were in self-isolation. Uh, we continued to work, the three of us. We, um, um, I was very fortunate. I could, I could go home to my place because I, I mean, I was alone, but um, uh, the others lived with family members who, while they may not have been concerned, they had family members who were concerned. My, my own, um, you know, brother and sister-in-law were very concerned, wouldn't come near me. Um, you know, just waiting out the period where, what was it, 30 days? I can't remember now. I can't even remember. 21? 21, thank you, 21, three weeks. Um, it, it was an uncomfortable time because you knew you, you had done everything right and you were still doing everything right. We, had, we continued to monitor our temperatures. Um, but yet we couldn't go back to normal. We couldn't live our lives normally. We, we worked in isolation. We lived in isolation. Um, we, we 
we were hugely, you know, encouraged and supported by by the the family and friends who who did come by and visit and and they and they showered us with with treats and and it was really really great but there are people who chose not to to see us and meet with us and and people who felt very strongly that we shouldn't come back to work in this building until that 21 day period was over it was very um, uncomfortable at times and and I did honestly get angry at times because I was doing everything right we had done everything right but I understand it I understand it now a year later better than then because at the time you're you're living it you're you're a little bit emotional about it but um so uh thank you to both of you it's been a fascinating um really educational uh discussion and uh I guess we'll wrap it up here thank you everyone for coming